Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid and I am the manager of programs here at the Center for Book Arts. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, the Center for Book Arts is located in the heart of Manhattan on 27th Street and Broadway. And we are an institution dedicated to the exploration and of the contemporary and traditional artistic practices related to the book as an art object. We usually host classes, lectures, poetry readings, exhibitions, and we hold studio spaces for artists. Um, but for uh, obvious reasons with the shutdown, um, we transitioned all of our programming online. Um, we've been able to host classes, um, artist talks and poetry readings. Um, this poetry reading is the second of a three part series. Um, it's our broadside reading series, which usually um, involves a collaboration between poets and artists where they create beautiful broadside posters, a limited edition run of 100. Um, the artist selects a poem from a poet's um, uh, poem selections collection and they produce this broadside that is then released at these readings that we would usually hold in person. Um, so we would also offer each audience member um, a free broadside at the reading. So for those of you who donated tonight, you guys should be expecting a broadside in the mail as soon as they're finished being produced. Um, so once our studios open again, we'll bring our artists back in and they'll be able to work on printing these broadsides. Um, so programs like these would not be possible without the support of our funders. Um, many thanks to the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. We'd also like to thank our members um, we really do rely on the support of our community. So I highly encourage you all to support um, somehow if you could donate or become a member, especially during this time. You can go to centerforbookarts.org slash support to learn more about that. So tonight we are so thrilled to have Selena Sue and Anna Gerton Wachter to share some works with us tonight. And a special thanks to Asia Wadud for her thoughtful curation and moderation of this series. Asya is the author of Cross Light for Young Bird, as well as Day Pulls Down the Sky, a Filament in Gold Leaf, which was written collaboratively with Okwi Akpakwasili. She is also the author of Syncope and the forthcoming No Knowledge is Complete Until It Passes Through My Body. Asya is a current resident at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and writer in residence at Dance Projects Platform. You can find her work in Eflux Journal, Bomb Magazine, Social Text Journal, Fence, and elsewhere. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she teaches poetry at the St. Anne School. So now I welcome Asya Wadud. Anna, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for, for hosting us for this, for last week and for this week. And a big thank you to the Center for Book Arts. And for all of you, it's so nice to see you, even though I guess all of you are a series of tiles across the screen, but I like to imagine that you're all smiling back at me. <laughs> so it's so great to see everyone tonight. Welcome. Um, tonight, as Jenna said, is the second reading in a series of three, um, three broadside readings. We had um, Mayfield Brooks and um, Benjamin Kruisling um, a couple of weeks ago. Tonight we have Selena Sue and Anna Gerton Walker, and then I invite you to come one more time on June 11th. We have um, Anais Duplan and Zara Patterson who will be joining us. So um, three readings. Um, so welcome, welcome to tonight's reading. I just want to tell you a couple of things about um, about how things will work tonight. So I will say a couple words about the broadside artists um, about their process and thinking about. Anna's broadside and then also in thinking about Selena's broadside. As Jenna said, normally we'd have a broadside to present to you tonight, but since um, the artists don't have access to their studios, those will be coming at a, at a later date. But I just wanted to read you um, a little bit about how Hong Yi Jang is thinking about Anna's work. 
So this is what she says. I connected with Anna's poem when I first read it. I saw a part of my younger self in it, native, reckless, but also brave and full of curiosity. I often would look to think, I often would like to think that I contain both my adult self and childhood self in one unified physical body. My current idea for this broadside design really relies on one word and one sentence from Anna's poem, stairs, and the basic idea of opening. I will use lino cut to print a stair-shaped design and will also add an upward brush stroke to connect two patterns. A free-handed brush stroke signifies an attempt to create in the beginning of becoming, making each broadside a unique experiment. Anna and I have discussed using a clean and crisp aesthetic. We both enjoy it when two colors meet and create a contrasting visual foreground and background for the readers. So nice. The primary colors I will use on the broadside will be blue and orange, two colors that are often linked to childhood playground in my memory. Um, and then speaking of blue and orange, this is, this is Anna's book, which is so beautiful. It reminds me a little bit of the blue and orange as well. So, um, uh, and then for, um, for Selena's broadside, this is what Linda Zebhang says, Sumanagashi marbling and papers within the book anatomy threshold are peripatetic in nature and seen as the door, the gate in which they exist as leitmotifs to symbolize the ritual aspect of one's movement between and into new bibliophilic wombs of verse, dialectic poetry, cadence, architecture, and music. Selena Sue's poem, Desire Line, signals a demarcated space one in which I am sanctioning Sumanagashi marbling as a passage to enter, withdraw, and roam. Here's Selena's book called Landia. They're so pretty. Okay. So I'll say a few words by way of introduction, and by, by way of introducing um, Selena, who will read first, and Anna, and we'll, I'll, I'll introduce them both now, and then Selena will read, Anna will read, and then we'll have a Q&A. While, while Selena and Anna are reading, you can use the chat window to send us any questions, and then we'll try and get to as many as we can during the Q&A, okay? So, grids are a framework of space bars that are parallel to or cross each other, a grading. They're also a network of lines that cross each other to form a series of squares or rectangles. Grids inherently acknowledge a system of linkages and connections. Their structures seize the edges of each gridded and girded room and can then decide what to do with the structure and constraint. What draws me to both Anna and Selena's work are the ways in which they each place objects, ideas, bound moments inside of grids, but then with purpose, move the thought, the object, the border from room to room to room. The scale of the room varies across their work, as does the cast of, of characters and the inhabitants of the rooms. I'm interested in how they each see the other, each see the order of grids so that they can then imagine a new order. Anna's poems and Selena's poems are plural and saturated. They slither and there is a steady acknowledgement that what was in one room might end up also in the next room. Selena writes in her debut collection, Landia, quote, we both lie, we both, sorry, we lie between the lines, the fine print of our social contracts, end quote. Anna writes in Utopia Pipe Dream Memory, quote, to put things next to each other, that's how you encounter the folds. Their work is prismatic and the doors are open. Selena Sue was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil and lives in Brooklyn. Her first book of poetry, Landia, was published by Belladonna in 2018. Her writing includes two poetry chapbooks, three books on the politics of social policy and civil society, and pieces in the New York Times Magazine and Plus One, Harper's and Elsewhere. Sue is the Marilyn G. Geitel Chair in Urban Studies and a professor of political science at the City University of New York. Anna Garten Wachter is a writer, editor, and archivist. Her first full length book, Utopia Pipe Dream Memory, was recently published by Ugly Duckling Press. She is the author of six chapbooks. Recent work has appeared in A Glimpse of Peach Magazine and the Poetry Society of America. She is one third of Double Cross Press, a poetry chapbook press, and she lives in Brooklyn a few blocks 
from the home in which she was born. Wow. So, um, so please welcome Anna and Selena. And as I said, you can send questions throughout the readings and then we'll get to them in the Q&A. Okay. So yeah, Selena, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Asya. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Anna, and all of you for being here. Um, this is my first Zoom reading. And so I decided to um, start off with a couple of poems about digitality. The first one is called The 403 is Not Verboten, after the HTTP 403 Forbidden Error page. What we wish for is hangout chat message deliberation, this conjoining with the other. For it seems that every December, I send out postcards wishing friends serendipity and delight. In return, the postal service sends blank stares. Because I conjecture, these sentiments sound shallow, cliched. In Aleppo, Damascus, Arakan, Juarez, Spotify, Forgetify, Crypto Party This, an echo chamber of my favorite friends' thoughts, all links and no thresholds. Clickbait my slacktivist. My fingers do the balking and my synapses remain. We wander towards another. The glass is always cleaner there. Being alone together is different from walking in rush hour at Penn Station, from standing without tongues locked at a New Year's party. It is to have one's intestines illuminated primarily, not solely, by the wet streaks of one's fears. The body is an evolutionary architecture that operates and becomes aware in the world. To alter its architecture is to adjust its awareness. A tattoo in the color of belonging, a binary code for what will never. Like Pessoa, we have usernames, dozens of avatars. Bots remind us to change passwords once a month, to speak new acronymic languages as mnemonic devices for no one but for people, for Citizens United. I download an app that turns my screens from blue to orange at night, as if my eyes dart back and forth any less during golden hour. We implant subcutaneous chips into our beloved black Labradors so that they are always found. Perhaps our beloved two-year-old toddlers too, those wandering terribles. These snark phones tether to our fingertips. This position the system positions me globally. It says, buy this dress instead of that one. It has been placed here for you. You can turn off a mobile device, but not a stratagem. This second poem is called This Augmented Fantasy of the Known, and it starts with a quote by Hakim Bey. Ours is the first century without terra incognita, without a frontier. Our bodies, machines of cognition, yes, but corpus incognita, more. When our manifest destiny cannot lead us to purchase Louisiana, we internalize physicality and attempt to extend our post-Cartesian consciousness. We make out with a lithe suite simply by adorning sheet goggles. We gallivant the galaxies of inner space, opening up skulls and inducing unremittent orgasms in Midwestern garages, in cookie cutter suburban developments. My tip of the tongue-shaped posterior cingulate feels swollen, trapped against the roof of my prefrontal cortices. And what of our phantom limbs, post-sweatshop factory digits, cripple me bionic, meta head body. So we say, constructing firewalls to gain the semblance of freedom, to tweak my neurological circuitry with the trendiest technocratic app, to virtually project my realist self, to drug myself sane, sentient in a senseless domain, to adorn my body in drag, to retort in camp, in which my artifice reveals hack me into pieces of reputation, plasticize my brain, wherein my second self has become my only. It's how we are wired out. Um, for this next poem called Notes on the Shape of Absence, I was thinking about what I could possibly do during this reading that would 
further acknowledge the um, medium it's taking place through. And I'm taking this opportunity to show a really beautiful film by someone named Olive Chi, Chi Uyang, who I think is here as um, it's a 2018 film by her as part of a speculative design project about memories, ghosts, and mourning rituals and mediated territories of the absent in the future of Hong Kong. And um, she had written me when she had read excerpts from Notes on the Shape of Absence. And I really love how um, how the poem and the film in some ways touch upon really similar themes, but in very different ways. Notes on the Shape of Absence um, was originally about personal loss and gentrification in Chinatown. So, but it is also about these heterotopias and back the past and the future. So I want to share my screen and share, um, share Olive's film. Notes on the shape of absence. We trace the dust lines left behind from the appliances, fumble for the brick foundations between the steel beams, peer at serrated stair lines where the wall paint stopped. Reincarnated. Tenement apartments become dance spaces without bars or mirrors in the dank basement of a bank on Market Street in anonymous green carpeted rooms on Mott Street. The first time I met WM, she told me, there were three main theaters that my family and I would go to. The Music Palace on Bowery, the Sun Sing on East Broadway, and the third one by the Manhattan Bridge, whose name I've since forgotten, and which is now a Buddhist temple. All of them played martial arts movies, ghost stories, and softcore porn. There was some kind of two for one ticket thing to do with the latter. I found a Life magazine spread about Sung Sing. It started off as the Florence New Strand Theater in 1921, hosting Yiddish language vaudeville. In 1940, a professional opera troupe from Hong Kong arrived. World War II broke out, so the troupe got stranded here. They took over the theater and performed every night. Death, resurrection, applause. I tried to imagine what Claude Levi Strauss thought as he sat in the audience, draw a causal pathway between these events. In 1942, the same year as that Life magazine spread, the company changed the theater's name to New Canton and made its last appearance. New Canton became a cinema and was renamed Sung Sing Theater again in 1950. In the late 1970s and early 80s, more non-Chinese folks showed up with Chinese language subtitles on top and English language subtitles on the bottom. In 1993, Sung Sing closed, entered the Wu-Tang 36 chambers featuring English dub audio samples from Shaolin and Wu-Tang 1983 and the 36 chamber of Shaolin 1978 hit stores. In the 36th chamber, Yu Da becomes Sante, learning Kung Fu in each of the Shaolin Temple's 35 chambers. Later, after helping his hometown defeat a brutal Manchurian general, he establishes the eponymous chamber, where the sacred can become a popular art form of resistance. Last I checked, Sun Sing had been demolished to make room for a shopping mall peddling cell phone accessories. At night, the dim sum palace across the street hosts dance parties replete with fog machine. In real life, I am told, my mother was not a phoenix, for phoenixes do not exist. It is not as if we spoke each Sunday evening so that I could properly miss her then. Her absence is not conspicuous. There is no definition. I cannot define it. I am at a loss for meaning. I constantly play a personal mad, mad lives. I am living for now, verb. I cannot think of loss without falling into platitudes, specificities, bishops, elusive art. 
when rhythms provide a cooing, a rocking back and forth, tender pain, a painful tenderness, traipsing across the board at 45 degree angles, telling its slant. Officially, we pay tribute when it is clear and bright. The polonia begins to bloom, voles transform into quails. Somehow, with eerie consistency, we stand under cl low cloud cover, winds chilling us to our bones despite the mild temperatures. Rainbows begin to appear. The facts do not change, for they are constantly rewritten. The ghostly Gowanus roofline I admired, now a Whole Foods store, complete with rooftop garden atop a super fun site. What remains seeps into our, the soil and our veins. I read that this was once the home of, I cannot differentiate the homage from the lament. As I resign, I surmise, more often than not, via whitewashing or semiotic deconstruction, the erasure. Sometimes these virtual landscapes feel realer than. Were we to name names alongside black rectangles to symbolize our mourning? Were we to combat the mundane ferocity that prefigures the rough ride? He testified to his 22 month old self. He testifies to his knowing. The windows, paint was peeling off the windows. I mull and articulate too slowly. By then, everyone else has covered these central angles. I summon my voice to, sound, to join the outrage, tangential weapon, ersatz activism with the bend of an index finger. I like it because I am exhausted, because I long for polyphonic song. This is not yet sacrifice, yet resistance, abolition, a refrain from each of us slumps forward tracing parallels. But what is clear is invisible. What is weightiest remains intangible. The difference is not that I do not know, but that I never will. I track most carefully what I cannot see. Opening one's eyes wide is not seeing, but believing. Thank you so much to Olive for allowing me to share that film. Um, I want to read a couple more poems that are very new. Um, I, I'm a little bit nervous about, um, about sharing them because they, uh, they're very new and my new poems tend to be a little bit cheesy and didactic, um, but I'm going to render, <laughs> let myself be vulnerable and try. So this one is about the Hong Kong protests, which I've been following a lot, um, partly, and I decided to write about them partly because of what's, go what's going on right now, especially with the new legislative bills, policing even civil dissent this week. Um, partly because next week is June 4th, the anniversary of Tiananmen, one of the three T's or three taboos vis-a-vis um, -vis the mainland Chinese states along with Tibet and Taiwan. And I've been so moved by the work of these protests as poetry, all the language simultaneously literal and figurative, evading and reimagining, double entendres to everything, and the courage under awful authoritarian rule. And writing this is also helping me think through my positionality and what I could possibly do from afar. And the other thing I just want to mention is a lot of the details. Um, in this work are, are about some of the puns used and because Cantonese, in Cantonese many words are monosyllabic and there's so many homophones and especially because the language is also tonal, there's lots of puns. So I can't speak Cantonese, I'm going to speak in a sort of Mandarin way, but 
can mean send back to China, strong as in Middle Kingdom, um, China. But if you say it slightly differently, it could mean um, giving away a clock so that now in Hong Kong, giving someone a clock is to place a curse upon them. Um, so this is called Lucid Dream after E Ling Lu, um, whose reportage I've been reading for this. The grass mud horses fled the plains. We now serve river crabs. Despite what JFK claimed, there is no opportunity in crisis. Yoda, Iron Man, Ski, Guy Fox, Hello Kitty, Joker, surgical, medical, laser, fluid resistant, personal protective, isolation, procedure, face. Between SARS and the current pandemic, a colonial era ordinance bans them all. But this year, the flu season ended six weeks early. To give someone a clock is to send someone off to China, in other tones, a funeral, whereby protest is an anagram of privation. It's raining, the firing of tear gas, a school pickup, an offer to drive to safety, to strike magic, set a flame, to renovate a street or shop with projectiles. Yellow ribbons and yellow umbrellas turn, crowded, black t-shirts and black capri pants, black baseball caps, sensible black flats, glasses, red fanny packs, gray gloves, amidst the blues triad surge clad in white, to dream with hundreds of thousands of others each Sunday, to dream in public. I dreamed on Waterloo last night. I re read that in Cantonese, dreams radiate, consistently pervade daylight hours. Fingers draw circles around their cheeks. Peace signs are not scissors, but pliers. With helmet sparrows on volant, hand in hand to resist the seduction of despair. If, like poetry, these dreams are the machinery not of memory, but remembrance, active molding, modeling, a failing, succeeding, ensuing the unresolved grief of melancholia, molten iron anger cooled, harnessed into encrypted legal briefs, water main blueprints. Amidst dogs, cockroaches, pigs, locusts, and vigilante lion birds, dog hole and linden chai, hands and feet. What can I, should we, do from afar to cross our three T's? No boomerang spirals into Beijing, perhaps still to dream in more than one language, even if it is common. My vernacular did this to me. It was not anointed so. To build a soft architecture of mutually constituted volition, sovereign, that we might open our eyes and blink open our mouths, sing that which we feel, know, but fail to recognize collectively a new public animal. Um, and the last one is also very new from the past couple of days. Um, and one of, one of the books that I read with my toddler as she goes to bed sometimes is The Book of Questions by Papa Neruda. Most of them are toddler board books, but that one, the stanzas are short enough so that maybe it can accommodate even her attention span, even though the doctor told me one year old, one minute, uh, two years old, two minutes. So I look forward to two minute attention spans. Um, and, but I was reading through the book recently and I was really taken aback that there are a number of stanzas about death in spring. And I'm used to, in a lot of cultures, us thinking about death around Halloween and All Saints Day um, in the fall and not as much in the spring. Um, so um, I decided to mull over some of those questions. And also this includes a lot of the names from this past Sunday's New York Times. Distancing 37. If from my ashes, surreptitiously scattered in the park, dumped into a sound or an ocean, Czechoslovakians might be born, we could then possibly transcend, finally, nation states on our paper holograms. 
that the land instead becomes Central Europe, the Balkan Southeast Europe, no longer balkanized. Not or, but and. Turtles do not reincarnate, they simply keep on living, trudging their beds from Dakar to Berlin, fine tuning the difference between their RAM and their hard drive. An order of passing. Cornelius Lawyer, 84, was a sharecropper's son. Michael Sorkin, 71, was a champion of social justice through architecture. Lorena Borjas, 59, was a transgender immigrant activist. Frank Gabrin, 60, an ER doctor, died in his husband's arms. Thomas Waters, 56, armed the affordable housing movement with data and analysis. Kimberly Nguyen, 33, a writer who inspired her Brooklyn High School students. Israel Sals, 22, a new father. Miles Coker, 69, freed from life in prison, the newspaper said. My mouth kisses no carnations, especially pink ones, nor chrysanthemum, chrysanthemums. Give me peonies, give me no imminent lips, but those I will kiss for decades to come. Their absence is just a bit less conspicuous this year, for I am ensconced this spring, trying to soften my shell. I make no pilgrimages to pay my respects to the cemetery or to a luxe overpriced Sunday brunch. Tulips fill the sidewalks, dogwoods, apple blossoms, purple allium bulbs, bearded irises, laid bare, casting away niceties, the pretense of normalcy, the precariat's willow, weeping, hyperventilating now. Verla Curry, 88, a nurse for a love with a love for language. Skylar Herbert, five. Valentina Blackhorse, 28, an aspiring leader in the Navajo Nation. Terry Thompson, 75, never knew anything but work. Kenneth James Godwin, 94, could spit a watermelon seed halfway across a double lot. Even as we fear it sneaking upon us from Haiti, it pounces from above. Upon 100,000 so far in this country alone, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say Haiti, I meant to say Hades. It pounces from above. Upon 100,000 so far in this country alone with its flight restrictions, Zapata County eminent domain, whether five or 100, premature. Georgiana Glose, 73, was a renegade nun who ran a nonprofit anchor in Brooklyn. Margaret Boucher, 89, would stay awake on the night shift because she didn't want anyone to die alone. His love of wildlife and the marshes fueled his soul. His name was Stuart, Fi Stuart Fish, 58. Adelpha Ruiz Galvo, 65, worked at the Pilgrim's Pride po poultry processing plant. We Chu Wong, 90, worked long, hard hours and ma still made time for everyone. Maria Tassiopoulos, 78, made the best baklava ever. From glistening crowns and serrated border walls, from wars and a reliance upon seasons, from fear of paper ballots from daily conferences, from growing up with sickness as sin and muscling through, the spike, the envelope, and membrane proteins create a casing, fusing with the host cell, inflaming alveoli, filling our upside down trees with fluid and debris. Ground glass opacity, but microbes are but pawns. By executive order, 3,000 stakes a minute slicing their shoulders. By 1,000 cuts, by a million, by a trillion. From efficiency, most vulnerable, bits of tenderloin. By executive order, whether five or 100, veal. Arlene Horowitz, 78, was, is a rising phoenix. Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia, 57, was the only one in his family unable to get a green card. Oscar Lopez Acosta, 42, died after being released from ICE detention. Janice Lynn Bisley, 70, the absolute favorite of all her nieces and nephews. Annie Glenn, 100, champion of people with speech disorders. Spring is typically when we flirt, when we unearth, when we speech, when we speech more with Others commune with the dead after the harvest moon. My family sweeps tombs after the spring equinox. 
The sight of her toddling quickly like a penguin to the window several times a day, standing there like a cat in a children's storybook, a cozy perch or a prison or a portal. Give me rainbow hair at golden hour, a mid-morning engagement party on the sidewalk with cheesy ass saxophone in the light rain, to maintain noise as a social practice, to console her, all those I hope remain implacable. Inspired by Terrell, I attempt to make peace with the shifting elements, but I read that he shut down his installation in the Queens Museum. Now, a luxury condo scrapes the sky he framed. Thank you so much. Selena, thank you so much. And thanks for bringing all those names into the room um, and for sharing Olive's work with us. Okay, Anna. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Selena and Asia and uh, Jenna and the Center for Book Arts. Um, my thing seems to be frozen, but you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Um, so, wow, that was just so lovely. Um, I was telling Asia right before this started that I used to briefly be an employee at the Center for Book Arts. And I think I was working there in part because I was attracted to the beautiful things that were being made there and I wanted to know how to do that. And it turned out that um, the better way to get closer to knowing how to do that was to make MC Highland my mentor, um, which has been really great um, and just lovely to know someone who cares so much about book arts and making beautiful book art objects. Um, I also see that Ben Krusling is here, whose reading last time was so incredible. I loved it so much. Um, and Zara Patterson, who I'm really looking forward to next time. Uh, Zara's book, UD, her UDP book was just one of my favorites. Um, I think I'm stalling. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm gonna read some poems. And first, I'm just gonna turn my timer on. Um, it was a little bit hard for me to find poems that would be good for a broadside because I tend to write sort of longer things. And I have this series of poems that are made by looking at artist interviews and sort of letting my eyes blur over them and just picking out words or phrases and recombining them um, as artists are trying to talk about what they do. Um, and so the broadside is going to be one of those poems and I'm going to read a few of those to begin with. And they are all untitled. So I'm just going to say numbers before each one so that you know when a new one begins. I used to make my alter ego use poetry when she wanted ordinary waking life over. Cities as real as ours. I have seen you, a spectacle of cynical time. In some ways, it's my stillness that schisms, the target we call you in your material form. Let's offer up a sheet of blank paper. I present to you a sheet of paper blank, background noise the disconnected delirium. I'm still in it. No leaders, no satellite image. There's this dog in the corner. I'm watching his behavior and I understand it as an all over end of day mood. Was the dog an important figure for you for confronting repetition? What is this place I present to you, this typewriter, this personal ad for a typewriter that I'm building, piercing, I want to be a spy. Number two. Why do you use the city like it's your story? One minute operational, attuned, find a way into everybody. 
Another, the first person accurate deforming burns down. Anything is tone, freeing the violence of the structure, a sculpted airport ghost edge town, another circling of events, the corner of your eye and I am, oh God, an obscurity, socially emptying the gesture where essences crisscross, a flamed mass of where am I going? I'm thinking about your GPS, its high notes. Somehow language, the remainder punishes me. I just love the threat of the voice how nonsense carries off impulse, sings it. This didn't happen alone in the asylum. I ended up teaching myself the skull, divinity, my attraction to the world's ventriloquism, how I, how I want to live it all out in the grocery store, implore the gods to restrain themselves a little, atrophy cuddled with light. So I wrote this breaking and direct stranded fringe figure on the lunar floor. Yes, I was singing, the driving kind of alive. And what was that like? I taught myself this stumbling point, hanging out in the middle of the street like it's a question or a stage. Um, I'm gonna ask my partner who's listening in the other room if he can turn the volume down <laughs> on his computer because I can hear myself talking back to myself and it's a little distracting. Okay, I was gonna leave the room to do that and then I realized I could just say it right here. Um, this third one is the one that the broadside will be of. Dear little womp womp, I wanted to make a book to say some things and suppress others to recreate my vengeance so I can enjoy it too. Greedy little womp circumstance. I freak out, I don't feel guilty. All I want is to freak out more. Let my face occupy this whole room. What interests me is our attitudes towards a work of love. If a nurturing work ethic ever yields. My younger self says hi. Here she is coming down the staircase. I was able to do real work then, stopping there on the stairs, it occurred to me, a figure at the entrance, the basic idea of an opening. Number four, hearing that talk, I think, step on a wooden comb, reversal, blankets and teeth notches, this is my failure too. Draft leap and non-knowledge, how it has no author, layers and maybe you feel this pleasure just 20 minutes more i'm in my nervous system phase what i love about having nothing to sell i want to be describing public debt its destruction here's that person who enters the poem ready to regurgitate or scream bite chew flick a switch humanity livable lives lost but what else is permeable since you can't get your dicks up naked and singing in the state capitol building and uh, just for fun i tried to write another one of these poems using the same process today and this is what came out a shelf of pills as source material, new customers in a story about being completely identified. As she descends her limited, her limited meaning, I was dealing with the personal, an intricate burst of dream learning, but weirdly disposable potential works. I never shift for my present tense for some abstract history of the impossible, a central horror of coordinates, I didn't know how to read, metastasized world, sketches for another one and only trove, I came late to love. And um, now I'm gonna kind of switch modes and read a few poems that are more in the style that I've been writing recently. They're somewhat, um, autobiographical, but hopefully about more than just myself. And um, this one I wrote about a year ago, or I've lost track of what time is, a while ago, around the time of the Christine Blasey Ford hearing, um, 
when I was in this feminist reading group that really um, sparked a lot in me. Um, yeah, so I'll read that. It's called, I need to get wasted tonight and destroy things. Everyone knows I shouldn't be getting high with you, going out for drinks, talking until I lose myself. Then someone interrupts to say, what are you doing? I thought of a line for a poem while we were in the shower, but couldn't say it, and now I don't remember. You take showers together seems to be the only takeaway, but what about that line, I can't remember who I was, and you can't seem to make sense of it either, how powerful and powerless I am all at once. I didn't want to share the line even with myself. I'll save being brilliant for later. Right now, a voice whispers in my ear, you'll be where I'm going. So everyone thinks they can read me, huh? They've always been able to. I've always come home late, puked into my pillow, swallowed the evening whole. I wanted to make sure I was really living. And will you be where I'm going? I do want to know how far across any room we might lock eyes stoned and ready. I guess the poetry is more alive than I am. I want to go home again. I imagine such a place formed into a dialogue that I can destroy, and I wonder if I'll be awake for it, the destruction. I imagine us swimming beside a boat in the dark. There is a photograph of me swimming in the dark with someone. No one can say who that person is, though we all remember that night. I had sex with one person in a gazebo, then found myself in a room with another. He was confessing something and kissing gently. Mostly I was present. How to say I've already had my fill tonight without any words if there were such a thing as being full. I'll take you home with me too, throw you in my truck, save you for later, but who was that person in the night water swimming next to me? It, in the photograph, we look like we know each other well. But enough of all of this. What does it matter? Desire and pleasure mix, we all know it. There is a part in David Vonarovich's tape journals where he is in his car, driving, listening to a song, speaking into his tape recorder, and he gets so sad thinking about all of the people who have died and how they will never get to hear this particular song, not even a song he likes very much. I see all of New York that way today. The subway, the panhandlers battling over who can ask first, the homeless men at my feet. I see them and I miss them as a preemptive gesture. I miss you already. Where am I going when there is no future? We imagine them saying the problem is not that we are fiends. The problem is that there is a country at all. And will I kiss you today? Give you some change? Write a love poem? poem that actually takes place in my body, a song that makes everyone imagine it playing without any listeners in a deep internal future when there's nobody left. Hmm. All right, I imagine that you guys are still here, right? That seems true. <laughs> um, I am gonna read a poem that I wrote on May 8th of 2020 um, during quarantine times, and it's called San Francisco Poem. <laughs> You're all here, great. <laughs> San Francisco Poem written in Brooklyn, New York on May 8th, 2020. Yesterday, I heard a man on his cell phone walk past me and say, well, you see, there is this virus going on. Who could he be talking to? Who wouldn't already know about the virus? Maybe it's a joke he is telling where he pretends that something isn't obvious. The joke of the virus being new and personal, just his own story. Or maybe he was talking to his mother or friend who can't remember anything recent, can't hold on to any new information at all. And so he will say over and over again, the reason she can't go outside is there is this virus that is going around. 
How many times a day does he bother to repeat telling her there is a virus, there is a virus, stay inside? I ask my friend in an online forum, what is a warning that is not a prophecy to which I get no reply? I thought that I was saying that a warning that is not a prophecy is based on truth and an inkling of pre-data before the event, but I stopped myself midway through the thought, not sure of what I might be meaning. Like when a person accidentally makes an argument for fascism through some route they hadn't known where it was leading, and then they want to take their logic back, rewind it and undo whatever got us here. When I came inside, I heard my neighbor's son, who I guess is also my neighbor, chanting, meat, meat, meat. And I could smell it too, the meat that was being cooked for him, for which he was impatient and for which he thought deserving of a chant while his little sister cried through his endless song. Maybe dinner would never be ready and he would be repeating meat, meat, meat until his throat was sore and tired and he fell asleep. I remembered the night that we never ate dinner when I was a kid. We just imagined and described what we wanted until we fell asleep, all of us in bed together. Nobody had the energy to make any food. It's a rich memory, but I'm unsure if it really happened or if the waiting for dinner only felt like it would never culminate in real food. Perhaps at some point I gave in and made some soup, tomato and rice soups, sprinkled with cheese. For some, reason, for some reason, hearing this meat chant prompted me to remember the time that I told you that I spent the most unmoored time of my life in San Francisco, quit my job and broke up with my boyfriend and took all of my savings and went there to do I had no idea what. What turned out to be just wandering aimlessly and crying on beautiful hilltops. I was telling you about how scary it was, how blurry the line is in San Francisco between being homeless and not, how one starts to feel sucked in and unable to ever leave or move, and then I looked around and saw all of these homeless people living in tents and ranting on the street, and I thought, you are not far from me, we are close. I saw in my life already plenty of moments when it could have happened to me when I almost ran away from home or refused to speak to my parents again or dropped out of school. And I thought about how fear of poverty is the main thing driving most people. You responded, no, that was a great moment of my life. I should interpret it as a great moment and meeting strangers was great and sharing a joint on the street with someone who has no joint was beautiful. And that was really what I went there for, wasn't it? Did I also meet the poet X and the poet Y? How could I have not met them if I was in San Francisco then? Perhaps I was not really in San Francisco. I remember that I met and then slept with a therapist and cried into his shoulder while he ate grilled cheese. He took me to see the giant redwood trees outside of the city and he made me promise I would go back to my life and try again. Just as I'm writing this, I get a text message from my friend who wants to know if I want to hear my horoscope. Sure, I say, and he sends it to me. I tell him I like that it says I will both get a lot done and sleep through a lot of the days ahead and that will all be okay. And he responds, yes, and the way it describes the relationship between the soul and the void is nice too. But I missed that part, skipped over it. I missed my soul. I missed the void. I'll have to reread it. Where is the soul and the void? part. It's there somewhere. I believe him, but I don't know how literal he is being and also what to say next when he says that he wishes we had telephones made out of tin cans. And I'm going to read one last poem that I wrote a few days ago. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope that you're relaxing in some way, but feels homey and different than if we were at an in-person poetry reading. Um, yeah. This poem is called Poem That Begins With Masturbation. 
While masturbating yesterday, I saw my spitting image, the girl who everyone calls my double. I was watching her from above as she rearranged her furniture, moving chairs into various formations, sitting in them and then rearranging them again. You were on the phone talking about how unemployable you'd become. And I suppose I could have told you, I'm not responding because I'm busy touching myself and thinking about the girl who looks exactly like me and moves her furniture around in order to change things up. But I guess I also don't have that much to say about the job market right now, except that it's a big part of what I like about you. Your unemployable, aimless inability to fit into any office culture. The last time I went to work, I asked the window washers if they get scared out there on the ledge. One of them said he's known plenty who have died, fallen to their deaths on the job, and it isn't very funny, he scolded, though neither of us had been anywhere close to laughter. I thought about what a non-event cleaning the windows is. Once a month, these guys jump out the window with a harness on and clean and leave, and we don't gather or usually look up from our computers. It's something akin to the lack of ceremony getting on an airplane has come to represent. Though, I'll tell you, there are some places in the world where people still clap at the landing, bring their whole families to see them off, take pictures of themselves buying their tickets or heading into security. It's nice to travel with someone who has never left the country before or even been too far outside of their hometown, like the guy I met who had never been outside of the small road that is Germantown, New York. And then when he was 20 years old, he went to Hudson, New York, 40 minutes away and felt like he had really arrived at, in quite a big city. It overwhelmed him, he said, the number of people he saw and the stores and the railroad tracks that cut through town. I was in Hudson, New York when I first learned the term food desert to describe an area with a lack of affordable supermarkets. I remember I bought an avocado there that cost $8 and I thought some mistake had been made. I walked back to the store to say they had made a mistake and the girl working at the register didn't respond with words. She just pointed to the sign where the price was listed. She seemed as if she knew I would return and wasn't in the mood to chat with me about the ridiculous policies and prices of food, though I could imagine that some days she was in the mood to talk about it and laugh and complain. Maybe we would even cut the avocado open together to see what an $8 avocado tastes like and laugh more and say an $8 avocado tastes it's a lot like a $4 avocado or a $2 avocado. And now I don't know how to segue here, but I want to tell you that I didn't think I had done anything at all with my day today. I was feeling kind of mad at myself for wasting the day, just playing games on my phone and staring into space. I hadn't written anything as I had meant to. And then I went to close my computer before falling asleep and there was this poem. This one that we're currently in was there written on the screen, but it wasn't anything. And I said out loud the words, it wasn't anything to confirm the day I thought I'd had. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. So, Hi, Selena. Hi, guys. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, yeah, I never know what to say right after. It takes me a while always to digest. <laughs> but thank, thank you for those words. Um, if you have um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, and we'll we'll see what we can get to. Um, I wondered. I have a question for you, Anna, to start. I wondered if you could say something, please about the title of your book, if you could tell us a little bit about um, where where it comes from. How is it, what 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 is up with the title? Can you yeah, explain what is up with it? that weird yeah. title? <laughs> it was funny, my sister said something about how nouns were really in right now when I told her the title of the book. <laughs> um, I like the idea of parts of speech having their own special moment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, 
the title is actually also from a different feminist reading group that Laura Henriksen started at the Poetry Project um, to read as many of the works of Bernadette Mayer together as we could. Um, and Bernadette Mayer has two works that one called Utopia and one called Memory. Um, and the pipe dream is something that Laura said when she was talking about those two works. And I just really liked thinking of her as the conduit that brought me to them. Um, and there are sections of the book that are um, the same way that those first poems that I read that sort of like stare at art artist interviews. Um, they do the same thing with um, interviews with Bernadette Mayer and with the sound artist, Marianne Amache, um, just because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, a, I have a question for you about the artist interviews, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait, um, yeah. I'll wait for it. Um, and Selena, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you um, about, I wanted to ask you about the intersection of your like policy and planning work and and your poetic, like your, your practice, your poetic practice, is there, do you, in your mind, do they intersect? What, like, what's, what's the relationship between them um, or, or like through them or with them? I'm just starting to think through this. And I wanted to ask you as well, because you have a background in it's planning. True. It's true. And I don't know if you recognize the name, but I included Michael Sorkin part, uh, partly yeah. because of you. Um, and um, so I've been thinking a little bit about how, uh, how so much about socio-political justice focus, so many campaigns focus on the immediate material conditions. And of course, those are so important, but that um, it's really hard in my work with activists and with, with planners to keep our eyes on the pie sometimes. And we focus instead on the gatekeepers and the other folks, the next challenge rather than an even bigger challenge of, and that there's something about poetry as a different way of knowing that, um, that maybe might help us to, to lay bare the, the structures or the conditions that we've become inured to um, and have normalized and lay the, and make them conspicuous again and imagine something different, which is why I was so taken with the fact that the Hong Kong protesters, because they have to also speak in euphemisms to evade censors, um, are uh, use the word dream for protest. Mm. Um, so when they, so someone might say, I was dreaming out on Waterloo Street last night. And, mm -hmm. but it's also literal wow. because they're also imagining a new reality. So it's not just a euphemism. Um, and that's the work of poetry, hopefully to me. Um, and, and the poem, poem I didn't read um, but that Linda is going to work on the broad, uh, broadside for desire lines, that concept also of making the road by walking. But first we, but it's hard for us to not follow the, the prescribed lines and, and figure out where we want to go and how with whom. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, yeah. That was like mic drop beautiful, <laughs> what you just said. <laughs> That's all that I have yeah, to say. <laughs> I think so too. Well, I th I'm I mean, still thinking about, I've been trying to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, my background is in city planning. I don't have an MFA. I have a master's in city planning and a master's in African studies. Um, and then I... Uh, I don't know. I think I, what you said resonates so much, this idea of poetry as being this other way into these, um, 
well, I don't know. I guess my thoughts around it are not really coherent at all yet, but. But I am curious, even if not met at this exact moment, yeah. I do want to just hear your thoughts on how your planning background have, have helped to inform what you do now in poetry. Yeah, I see it, but I'm not, I see it in your work, but I'm not sure I can articulate it precisely. Yeah. I, and I, and I see it in your work and I feel it in my work, but I'm not sure exactly yet. I mean, it, it, when I think about it, it feels like there's no, it feels like they're one in the same. Sometimes I start to think about like, oh, should I have just gotten an MFA? It's like, well, but I guess I don't understand. Well, anyway, maybe this is a different conversation. We can talk about it. Some other time. No, go on. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> it's a really, um, it's a really nascent thought, so I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to it. Um, Anna, Anna, do you want to say a little, hi Anna, do you want to say a little bit more about, I'm really curious about the artist interviews and this process mm -hmm. of like using the artist interviews as a starting point to, as like a place to start or a place to, to move, move through as, as you write. Can you say something about if you want to, if you'd like to yeah, yeah. pull back the curtain a little bit. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of things I write are about feeling that feeling where you feel like you um, can't speak, where it feels like there aren't words for whatever it is that you want to say. And I always, I feel that like uh, whenever um, there's been, uh, someone's asked me a question <laughs> about my work. I feel that like, um, it, there's so much that's hard to describe, or even when reading other artist interviews that there's hard, something that is, it's all of the material that surrounds the making of the work that is still so far away from the actual experience of experiencing it. It sort of ties in a little bit with my job because I work as an archivist and so we end up dealing with a lot of the ephemera that surrounds events and that sort of tr tries to describe historic moments and you just take what you can get at, from all of these uh, scraps to try and rebuild a memory. Um, and so that's kind of where my interest in it began and then I had been taking this workshop where we were um, talking a little bit about walking and like I don't even remember landscapes somehow the idea of thinking of an in, of a set of words in a, as a visual landscape that one could purposefully blur your eyes to let see in a different way came up um, and I really liked that. Uh, but it's very different from a lot of the other work I write. So I think of it as like, just kind of for funsies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know. Does yeah. that, did you have any particular, um, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Do you guys have questions? <laughs> <laughs> I only know if you ask them. That's the only way to know. <laughs> um, Selena, I was wondering about some of your collaborations. I was reading a, a piece, um, a recent piece, I think with, with Annie Lane in The Believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to, can you say something about some of your, like some of your recent collaborations and how they've come about or how you, how you, how you think with people? Sure. Um, I just, I recently um, took some opportunities that were assignments um, for just to try to produce some work and decided to make them collaborations because um, it just helps me to ground myself so much so it's part um so it's partly about thinking about 
um, what participatory research looks like if I think about my academic role and thinking about what it means to destabilize one's authority and co-learn with others and in thinking about different epistemologies. But it's also really practical and selfish in that I feel overwhelmed and I don't know what to say and if I make it a letter to someone I respect, then I can I can say, okay, I don't have to be the ultimate expert here. I need to write something that is true and grounded. And it gives me a specific audience to, um, to think about and try to connect with. And mm -hmm. that's, and, and try to take seriously knowledge production as mutually constitutive and trying to keep up my bargain and my end of that and just trying to destabilize dominant texts so that I so I'm I haven't turned back to I haven't tried this in my official academic journal articles yet but I'm wondering if I could possibly you know like legal texts legal articles are half footnotes anyway, maybe I could start to write texts that um, that highlight other people's voices or that at least destabilize my own with a really big, really long end notes and footnotes and subtext that way. Mm -hmm. I've been just trying to think about um, how to, how to not, how to refuse strict categorizations and typologies by by engaging collaboration and um and the collaboration with Annie Ling was really lovely because it was actually Alyssa Court who's an editor at the Economic Hardship Reporting um, Program project um, that. Um, suggested that we that Annie Ling and I work together on thinking about Chinatown and we were residents there at the same time and there were so many linkages that we would have never found otherwise that also then reverberated in different ways and helped me to understand these experiences in newly prismatic ways. Mm. So for instance, I was really taken with a 1903 story about recent Chinese immigrants in 1903 um, hosting a porkless seafoodless dinner for new Russian immigrants who were fleeing the pogroms at the time and they were trying to build new solidarities at the beginning of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and I mentioned in the poem um, a Jewish cemetery that was in the alongside Division Street since the late 1700s and it used to be huge and now it's like a tiny plot of land. But, um, and I and I mentioned a couple of um, a couple of events that um, for against Chinese and Russian immigrants, and it turned out that that she had personal relatives who were from the places that mm. uh, that that were mentioned, and also that she lived next to the lap the surviving cemetery and had just happened to have taken a picture of that cemetery, the few headstones that are left. And, and it really bring, brought to life um, layers of history and palimpsests and all, um, all of these things that may or may not be in the archives that, um, that I want to try to remember as we try to figure out what we want to do next for mm -hmm. the neighborhood or for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting what you say about, um, I mean, just pulling back this idea of like thinking alone. It's like whoever, like whoever thought anything alone, it's, I mean, it's always a process <laughs> of lineage, like a thought lineage and with and, 
um, and this idea of all these connections that you and Annie were able to make that would have otherwise not even been lost, but they would have just been unknown to you if you had been like working alone on this project or hadn't, you know, hadn't, hadn't been working with her. Um, and I guess I'm trying to figure out how to make these conversations a little bit more explicit that even when, when, even when it's not a co-authored piece, that it's not just about these people that I was really trying to think with them and I had them in mind and just trying to figure out how to, I know that there's politics around citation and who you cite and give credit to, um, but I'm also thinking about how I want everything to be a letter because <laughs> otherwise <laughs> I also feel spend, we're all spending so much time by ourselves in our apartments or our homes now. I want to, I want every piece of evidence I can collect of how I'm still connected to others, even if they're not physically here. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Everything should be a letter. <laughs> hmm. um, so Maybe I have I have one more question that I'll ask the both of you, and then anyone anyone who's here who wants to answer, feel free to put an answer into the chat. I'm wondering if there's um, something that you've read recently, or a song you've listened to, or I don't know, a painting you've seen, or something that you just want to leave us with, maybe to pass on to us. Um, Anna, <laughs> you're nodding your head. <laughs> I, just, I just do that. <laughs> you just do it. <laughs> it's just relaxing. <laughs> um, I'm sitting at my desk with like a million poetry books above me. They're like, I'm like bowing to them. <laughs> um, I'm in the poetry corner. But um, I tend to read like three books at once. One a poetry book, one a novel, and one a, what's the other word? <laughs> nonfiction, nonfiction yeah. maybe. Um, and I read this book uh, uh, about the Black Panther Party and the fight against medical discrimination. And I just was trying to think about the history of healthcare activism, um, which I had. I, there's so much that I that I always am trying to re-educate myself that I feel was left out of my lengthy education that amounted to not enough. And um, it's a really well-written book and really powerful. And I feel like it's really good for these times. I, it's like, I kind of go back and forth on whether or not I want to be thinking about healthcare right now, like whether or not I can even engage in thinking about it because it's so horrible but um i really recommend that book can you tell me the title so i can put it yeah. in the chat for people it's called body and soul by alondra nelson body and soul to look at the spelling of their name a-l-o-n-d-r-a -A. oh hold on sorry i'm very slow um a-l-o-n-d-r-a yeah. -A, alondra alondra nelson Nelson. I've also read -E -E. a really good poetry books recently. This book, You and Me Forever, mm -hmm. I thought was phenomenal. Um, I absolutely loved Thresholds by Lara Mimosa Montes. And I'm reading the overstory right now, which everyone says is so great, and I want to love it, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> That's all. Um, the overstory. I the missed overstory. the overstory. I missed this one. Do you want to put it into the chat for us, Anna? The overstory, sure. Yeah. I can put all of the things into the chat. If you okay. Want. I, you put, I put body and soul. I put me, you and me forever. Wait. Sorry. It says. Can I do it publicly? Yes. Yeah. Wait. No, it's turned off. Um, what about, 
Uh, do you... Oh, wait, I think I can do it. No. Never mind. Got it. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thanks for those recommendations. What about you, Selena? Um, I, well, just to give everyone a heads up, Asia had given us a hint that she, <laughs> she was going to ask this question. So um, one random thing is that I, I really like arugula, but, um, but it's not always the most, I don't know, salads, I'm not always, they always don't always fulfill me. <laughs> and there was a card in the farm share that last week that was for arugula soup. So Ooh. if you just make it like leek, use it instead of like potato leek soup, potato arugula soup, that's basically what it is. Um, it was really good. So <laughs> you said recipes. So that was one thing. Yes. And I couldn't find potatoes. So I used a can of white beans, quarantine cooking. Um, and it was actually quite good. Um, and a book that I'm reading now is called Hungry Translations. Mm. Sorry, I can't. Hungry there Translations. Okay. Hungry Translations, Relearning the World Through Radical vulnerability by Richa Nagar. I'm going to put in her name. And it's a really beautiful book um, about her field work and her work with, um, with theater troops and different folks in India, but it's most, it weaves in poetry. Um, it, even though it's an academic book, but it's really about um, acts of translation and approaches that counter dom, counter what um, Joy, this other academic called Joyce King calls epistemological annihilation mm -hmm. and how we really try to work with others in so, um, in lots of the kinds of ways that you and I were talking about a few minutes ago. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm reading right now that I'm really loving. And I have, I'm a horrible singer. So I'm really <laughs> sorry, everybody. But the song that I can't get out of my mind these days, which perhaps reflects, unfortunately, my level of emotional maturity, because <laughs> I actually find it useful, is from my one-year-old Daniel Tiger TV show. And it's that sometimes you can feel two feelings at the same time, oh. that's okay. And it helps me out sometimes. <laughs> we all need that. So, wow. so I'll be watching Daniel Tiger. <laughs> so it's developed by Mr. Rogers Workshop. So it's all about trying to uh, social emotional intelligence which clearly I need because that song comes back to mind yeah Daniel Tiger oh, that's a that's a great recommendation you know I just I just watched um the Mr. Rogers um I can't remember the name of it right now the documentary that came out a couple of years ago yeah so beautiful um Daniel Tiger <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Love it. Yes. Selena, I didn't know um, about this, about this equivalency. One year equals one minute of attention. Two years equals two. Does it continue for our whole lives? I don't think that it's <laughs> linear. I think that somehow it's supposed to turn up around age four or okay. something. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> we wouldn't yeah. even be in good shape. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's more or less eight o'clock. So unless anyone has any any last questions, um, I will <laughs> wish you a good a good evening. And we're gonna meet one more time on June eleventh for Zara Patterson and Anais Duplan, who will be reading. Um, on that evening. And I just want to thank, I want to thank Selena and Anna for sharing your work, for sharing new work, for sharing, I don't know, just for sharing work 
that is so of the moment and so for this moment. And um, thank you, Jenna, for having us and for hosting us tonight, Center for Book Arts. And um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Okay, see you soon.